Yes, Walden's Pond rolls on here at 104 in the afternoon on this fourth day of May, 1995. And by the way, it's been six years since this program started. Uh, six years ago that Walden's Pond commenced here, and we're still here. And uh, I thank you for all your support in the program over the years. And today we'll be taking a look at a very controversial topic. It's called circumcision. As you well know, a male circumcision is the surgical removal of the foreskin, the skin which normally covers and protects the head of the penis. Throughout history, people around the world have practiced circumcision. For some, as with Jews and Muslims, it has been a religious ritual. For others, as in Australia and Africa, it has been a puberty rite. The United States is the only remaining country to continue the practice of routine circumcision on the majority of its male infants for non-religious and non-medical reasons. In fact, 85% of the world's male population is not circumcised. Circumcision began in the English-speaking countries during the, during, the mid during the mid 1800s, supposedly to prevent masturbation, which was believed to cause many diseases. Since that time, various rationale have perpetuated its practice, but all of these, including the claims that circumcision prevents penile and cer cervical cancers and the spread of venereal disease, have been disproven. To remove the foreskin for hygiene is no more logical than pulling teeth instead of cleaning them. We now recognize that the foreskin is a normal, healthy, and necessary body part. This comes from the National Organization of Circumcision Information Resource Centers. And we'll be talking with uh, the founder of that organization very shortly here over WBAI. Walden's Pond continues. This afternoon's program, the focus is on circumcision, particularly male circumcision. And in this part of the program, we'll be talking with Marilyn Milos. She is director of the National Circumcision Information and Resource Center. And she got into, uh, involved with, it, with this issue about 16 years ago um, after witnessing a circumcision in a hospital. And um, I want to welcome you to WBAI. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Uh, now, you, what's your official title again? You're the... I'm, the, I'm a registered nurse, and I'm the founder and the director of NoCirc. Okay, which is a national organization of circumcision information resource centers, and you're in uh, California. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, explain to the audience um, how you got involved in this very uh, controversial and uh, uh, painful procedure. Uh, how did you get involved in in, in uh, uh, campaigning against it? Well, I'm the mother of three circumcised boys, and like most parents, of the my oldest is in, uh, 36 or so, and the youngest is 26. So during those years, circumcision the circumcision craze was really at its height, I think. <clears throat> and um, I was I bought into what the doctors had told me that circumcision didn't hurt. It only took a second. It would remove an unnecessary part of the body and protect my sons from all kinds of, from a myriad of ills. And I believed the doctors. And so when my youngest son was 10 and I was a nursing student, um, I saw circumcision for the first time. I didn't, I hadn't seen my sons being circumcised. I didn't know why they slept for so many hours after their circumcision. I didn't understand the trauma. I have to say to you, Sheldon, I... You know, I do this work every day, and in the process of doing this, I can't live every day in that in the moment that how I felt when I first saw circumcision. It was so mm. traumatic, and it, it was a moment that literally changed the course of my life. Mm. Um, so I sort of distanced myself, or you just do the work and without all, re referring back every moment to those initial feelings. But listening to the woman and listening to her talk about the baby weeping, mm. uh, I'm deeply, deeply moved, and uh, I was move to tears, a place that I, mm. as I say, in 16 years of doing the same kind of work, you don't, you know, just, I'm sure you understand with yes. animal rights, you see it once and you're moved, but you can't live in that place. Sure, absolutely. But here I am again, moved like that. Well, wow. 
as a nursing student, we yep. saw we were we filed into a room, and I didn't expect. You know, we said oh, we're going to see a circumcision now, and again, now my youngest was ten years old. I had learned nothing in the twenty years of mothering. I'd learned nothing about this procedure. Uh, there really is a, it's denial. It's um, we're, it's a taboo subject. Nobody really talks about it. So mothers don't have an idea. That we don't have a clue. I never saw my son's body's whole. Uh, I'll go to my grave. Oh, sorry about that. I never saw their little penises with the skin covering it the way it was supposed to be. But as we walked in as a student to walk into a, the, the nursery with all the little babies around in their cribs and one baby strapped a spread eagle against, on, on a circumcision board across the room, struggling against the restraints, making the same sounds I think I would be making if I were str- uh, 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 trying to get out and pulling against the restraints. And I felt such empathy for him. I said to my instructor, can I go comfort him? And she said, no, wait till the doctor gets here. Mm. Well, that, of course, in itself is shocking. Here we're, this, these are healthcare professionals. How can we watch this? We're all standing around watching this human struggle, this tiny newborn baby mm. struggling against restraints, and no one is helping. She said, so when the doctor walked in, I said, can I comfort him? And she said, uh, the doctor said, sure, go ahead and stick your finger in the baby's mouth. So I started to do that, and the baby settled down. I was rubbing his head, and he just was sucking a lot. And um, and then when the doctor started to do the cutting, well, actually, the first thing they do is to tear the foreskin from the glands because in, in infancy, the foreskin is attached. Like the fingernail is attached to the to the fingernail bed. The, the foreskin yes. is attached to the head of the penis. Mother Nature is perfect in her design. Urine and feces can't get under the foreskin in infancy because there is connected by this common membrane. So the first thing they have to do is to, to, to t- literally skin the penis alive. They tear the foreskin from the glands. And so as the doctor started doing that, the baby let out a scream I had never heard a human being make. And I just began, my lips started to quiver, and I realized I'm standing in front of all of my classmates. The, uh, uh, the baby screaming. I started to sob, and the doctor looked into my face, and he said, there's no medical reason for doing this. Well, that gave, that was the question mark. Why, then, do, were we doing this to babies? If there's no medical reason, this is clearly not a nice thing to be doing. So I began to do research so that, uh, that from that day forward, and it's been 16 years of an, quite a fascinating study. If it weren't so traumatic and so painful, if there weren't those suffering on a, on a daily basis, it wouldn't be quite so difficult. Um, mm. But that people deny what, in fact, we're doing or don't want to face it or don't want to talk about it. Um, I came to learn that we're the last country in the world, as you said, to practice this. 85% of the males in the world have normal penises and uh, don't suffer the, the horrible consequences. Our medical profession says what happened to our babies if we... So if we don't subject them to this surgery, and, and the excuses vary um, from one thing to another. Uh, of course, it's a quarter of a billion dollar a year industry, mm. and uh, in the other English-speaking c- countries that adopted circumcision also for medical reasons, well, the first medical reason was to prevent ma- masturbation, but the other countries, for example, in England, when the British Health Service realized that circumcision was a, um, a, a, a was an unnecessary surgery and that the foreskin is normal, healthy, functioning tissue, it has a reason, like every other part of the body, to be there, the national, the British National Health Service stopped paying for it. Mm. We can we can assume, then, that there probably is some profit motive here. <laughs> at, at least yes. that's one of the reasons that this continues. Um. That story you just told is is really uh, it's, it gives me chills. You mentioned some of the uh, explanations for this procedure, uh, and because it's it's done pretty regularly uh, uh, throughout the uh, after every birth, it's it's done. What are the hygienic concerns that doctors give for this procedure? Well, that it's going to the penis will be cleaner without a foreskin, and yet it takes less time to clean wash under a foreskin than it does to wa- for a female to wash the labia. Yet no one suggests cutting those off. Yes. We could cut pull our teeth, and we wouldn't have to brush them. And you know, yeah. I mean, such an absurd excuse. What you carried to its end, we might as we, you'd end up with no body parts for, for, yes. because you'd have to wash them. Usually, <laughs> the doctor who says that it takes less time to wash under a foreskin than it does to to uh, wash behind the ears, and if it takes any longer, it's usually associated with a smile. Yes. I think it's the smile, however, that puts everybody uptight. <laughs> yes. I, I guess they, they're, they're assuming that people um, will not practice uh, uh, 
proper hygienic uh, procedures. And isn't, are men should be horrified by mm. that, you, to, for anyone to assume that they don't have the brains enough to wash a penis. And then the other part of this, you mean to tell me you don't have to wash a penis because it, because it doesn't have a foreskin? This is, it's just absurd. Circumcision has a strong, irrational bias that seeks validation. And, we, and the medical community has tried to legitimize it, tried to justify it with one excuse after another. As soon as one excuse dies, the next one comes. So latest excuse is that it's going to prevent or decrease the risk of AIDS. Yes. Unfortunately, they've said that in the country with one of the highest circumcision one and one of the highest AIDS rates in the world. So on its face, it's so preposterous that it's, it was just too preposterous for most most sane people to believe. There's a, still a few doctors ranting and raving, but uh, for the most part, it's... Uh, well, you know, it, it, in, uh, I'm thinking uh, now, um, Ms. Milo said uh, that the we have in this country, um, particularly recently, uh, um, this uh, tradition of uh, plastic surgery, and uh, uh, you know people get all kind of uh, things done for cosmetic reasons, whether uh, they want to uh, have thinner noses or, or uh, bigger buttocks or, or whatever. You know, we have all kind of ways to make the body more beautiful, in, in a sense. Um, it's third, isn't it? <laughs> it? It really is. And, and to me, uh, I look at this too as another part of of the body beautiful concept. Uh, you know, this cosmetic surgery. Yeah. When someone say to me, "Oh, I think a I think a circumcised penis looks better," I said, "Well, uh, go to, go and look at Michelangelo's David. If you yeah. uh, you know, uh, look at classical art because it's only our conditioning that has us believe that. But even so, if a human being grows up and says, "Gee, I want to have a nose job, or I want to have larger breasts, or..." smaller breasts or whatever they want to do with their bodies, let them. That's their business. But to do this, to assault the body of 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 an unconsenting, innocent baby, you know, again, in the the woman's monologue that when we first began the program, she talked about her her father and how he kept putting her down. What what have we done to the male in this um, society? We're we're talking about the most important organ of the male body. Mm. I said that to a woman once. She said, well, if men just didn't think so much about their penises. And I said, if men didn't think so much about their penises, Mother Nature would have failed in her design. Mm. They're supposed to think about their penises. It is, this is the organ of procreation. And what have we done? We've, we, in a violent act, in the first days of life, in the pre-verbal period when a man cannot even get in touch with that tremendous terror and pain that he's been made to suffer, he's been taken from his mother, um, how do we, how can we expect more from the male? And one man said to me, gee, when you do this to a man, you, you, uh, he, he's perfect cannon fodder when he grows up. Circumcisions are only done in dominator societies, whether it's the female or the male. Mm. It's done to the, re, the reproductive, the organ of pleasure and the reproductive organ. Mm-hmm. To, to, leaving a scar on that precious part of the body. Mm-hmm. And, and, and interestingly, in America, in this sexually sick society, the men who weren't lucky enough to escape the knife and not be traumatized and terrorized like this uh, and mutilated uh, ended up being called uncircumcised. So we've made them abnormal, too. So here we've got the most important organ yes. of the male body. It's the symbol of sexuality, the symbol of masculinity, how a man perceives himself, his self-esteem, his, his all of these things mm-hmm. about himself. And we... And we've left a scar. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, mm. And and then and and I, I was speaking at the University of Massachusetts some years ago, and I was talking about working in the hospital and how interesting it was. I had already studied Eric Erickson's um, work in terms of human development and the eight stages of man, and he had talked about the first two years we developed trust. And I was saying how, you know, in the, in the hospital, the boy's work had become known. We needed to welcome babies, not hold them upside down and whack them on the behind when they came into the into life, but rather to love them and welcome them gently and, and how they... How they were welcomed to Earthside would probably be how they would approach new experiences throughout their lives. Was it going to be with clenched fists or was it going to be op- open-handed? Was mm. so um, it, it, it was so incongruous to me to be in the hospital and people were welcoming these babies, lowering the lights, playing soft music, talking sweetly to the baby. So he got this gentle welcome, and then two days later he's strapped out under bright lights, and a big mass man comes and 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 mm. mutilates his. Yes, yes, yes. So I was saying this at the University of Massachusetts, and a woman psychiatrist came up, and she said, um, 
after I had said, um, how, how can that baby have established trust? How can that first developmental task be successfully completed? And she said to me, you're absolutely right, it can't be. And she said, but what you didn't say, and what you need to understand is that regardless of who does that surgery, whether it's the, uh, it's the medicine man with his tribal markings wielding a rusty razor, where, whether it's the moil under his yarmulke and shawl, whether it's the modern medicine man behind his surgical mask with a scalpel in his hand, the, it, it doesn't matter who does the cutting, it's perceived by the baby as betrayal by the mother. She was responsible for the completion of that first developmental task. Mm. It's the mother who should have held on. If we were mother lions, would we let someone do this to our babies? Of course not. You'd eat them. <laughs> mm, mm. Let, me, let me ask you, by the way, it's one thirty exactly. This is WBAI 99.5 FM, listener sponsor community radio in New York City. Shelton Walden. I'm the host of Walden's Pond. We're here every Thursday between 1 and 2 o'clock. Uh, this afternoon, we're talking about male circumcision, and we have Marilyn Milos, who is the director and founder of the National Circumcision Information and uh, Resource Center, uh, and we're talking about circumcision this afternoon, male circumcision. Um, this, of course, as you know, uh, has been a religious ritual with Jews and Muslims uh, uh, for centuries. Um, how do you address people of those faiths? Of co- and cultures who say that um, this is a tradition, it needs to be done, uh, and that uh, what you're talking about here is uh, is wrong, um, that it's, it should be done for hygienic reasons and for religious reasons. Well, for anybody who's doing it for religious reasons, it's not done for hygienic reasons. It should only be done for religious reasons, and it's been interesting to me, all the, num- the number of moils that I've argued with over on radio and television who get into the... Um, uh, medical issues, again, trying to justify this surgery. Uh, now, I've been called anti-Semitic for the first ten, 10 years of my work. I heard from people and I was called anti-Semitic. My teacher in this, by the way, was a man by the name of Edward Wallerstein, um, who <clears throat> wrote a book called Circumcision, an American Health Fallacy. Mm. And he said to me, um, Marilyn, stay out of the religious stuff. You're not a Jew. This is not your issue. <clears throat> You're a, a nurse, and you can fight it on, on those grounds, and that's enough. That's all you need to do. So I did. In about 1987 or so, I got a letter from a Jewish lawyer um, who was living in Florida at the time, and he said he wrote and he said, your work is becoming known worldwide, and I applaud your efforts, but it's all, I'm, I'm also aware of the fact that you are only defending the rights of um, of." of rights of boys who are non-Jews and non-Muslims. And he said, uh, he said I w- I'm a Jew, and my parents circumcised me, but it was my body. And they didn't have any right to inflict this on me. And he said, why aren't you defending Jewish and Muslim boys? Don't you think they have a right to a foreskin? What's wrong with you? Are you anti-Semitic? <laughs> and then I thought, oh boy, I can't, <laughs> I can't win on either side of this issue. Um, and then, about two years later, I... Uh, organized the first international symposium on circumcision, and this is that it had been ten years. Uh, I, this is uh, really at the culmination of the first ten years of my work, and I invited everybody who I who, whose stuff I had read and wanted to hear speak. It was, it was a really a marvelous and profound experience for all of the, all of us, the speakers and participant uh, participants alike. And I think when we saw the um, a video of the little girls being genitally mutilated in Africa for other religious reasons. You know, there's another God saying, oh, you have to do this. To me, it became, um, I I just realized that this was a human rights issue, that we don't have a right to do this to anybody else. And um, there's a lot of Jews now who are choosing not to do that. For those who who, um, are Orthodox, who live by the covenant and believe in in, in that faith, what can you say? (laughs) They're going to do this. But... uh, there are many Jews throughout Europe who don't practice circumcision, and I think that the Jews in America practice it because of this confusion of, of um, between religion and medicine. Mm. Um, that medicine man has become, <laughs> become broader in, in, in America, you mm. know, in American life. But uh, there are a, a wonderful uh, piece that was written by the wife of a rabbi who talked, <clears throat> who talked about that she's from France, and she said that, uh, and she's Jewish, and her her and brother were our pediatricians, and she said nobody in their family had ever circumcised because they were not observant, they were not Orthodox Jews, mm-hmm. uh, Reformed Jews, and they, and they just didn't do that. Mm-hmm. 
and what she was trying to do then was to educate the, the non-Orthodox Jews in, in America that not, not to buy into the medical belief system because it's not, <clears throat> that's not what's, what's happening. I would encourage the Orthodox Jews who do this because of, it's a, their belief system. Um, so, <laughs> it's always amazing to me to, to believe in a, in, in a God who demands a blood ritual of babies. I mean, the, is, is this the God of love? But, yes. but for those who do, to go back to the original... Uh, the original form of circumcision, which was simply um, either a nick or the removal of a very small portion of the foreskin. It wasn't the total ablation of the foreskin. For 2,000 years, the part of the foreskin was removed. Was, was, they never tore the foreskin from the glands. The mucosa was not torn away. It was simply, I guess what you call the overhang or a little, a little piece of the skin that was taken right at the tip. And it, during the Hellenic period, when the Greeks were paganizing the Jews, and the Jews were wanting to um, play in the, at the Greek in the Greek games, and they wanted to, uh, well, I guess it was considered um, sort of impolite or improper or uh, like sort of sticking the tongue out. They had the glands exposed, which was just kind of crude or just not polite. So that the Jews then began to wear. Um, ties and rings over their foreskin, pulling it forward to hold, to keep the opening closed so that the glands was not exposed. And, it, and that was really, in fact, the first history of foreskin restoration that, that we know of today. And also, it was when the rabbinate then said, oh no, we can't do it like this, and they began then to ablate the entire foreskin. So it's only been for 2,000 years that the entire foreskin has been removed. So again, as I said, I, I would encourage Jews who who think that this is absolutely essential to their practice, to, to, to go back to that original, less invasive, less intrusive, less damaging mm. procedure. Mm. And again, that's a small percentage, so that's not who I'm dealing with for the most part. You mm. know, there's, that's a small percentage in America. Yes. Um, one question before we take a break. Uh, uh, well, in your area, in California, uh, Northern California, and the hospitals uh, in that area do... Are the hospitals requiring this? They continue to require this of newborns? No, it's not required. In fact, you're supposed to have to sign a consent form. Mm. But when the doctor says, oh, you don't want me to, you don't want him to look different in the, in the locker room, do you? Mm. <laughs> Shall we just do a little trimming? Shall we snip him in the morning? Mm. Um, I, and that's pretty much the way it's supposed to be throughout, uh, across the nation that, that the parents are supposed to consent for this. I've been an expert witness on a number of cases where the babies were circumcised without parental consent. And in fact, in one case, the mother wrote no circumcision on three different consent forms, mm -hmm. and it, her baby was still circumcised Jeez. on a good settlement in that case. But of course, it, the baby's been denied his foreskin. That's right. It's too late now. It's, it's, it's just, oh. Yeah. And you know, one of the important things I think we need to talk about is that the foreskin is... Um, important tissue. It protects and covers the head of the penis, and for the it's the same as the clitoral hood, protects the clitoris. Yes. So when they remove that, it leaves, a, first of all, tearing it, tearing the foreskin from the glands in infancy, leaves a scar on the glands, and the major complaints I've heard, and I didn't expect this aspect of my work, two things to happen. First was I, when I saw a circumcision, I was devastated, and then the second thing was realizing that if I'm going to be saying what's going on to babies behind closed doors, I was going to be letting every other man know what happened to him, mm. and that was kind of a, a hard thing. Well, what do I do then? Keep my mouth shut? No, we have to stop this. I've uh, since then, of course, come to realize that in order to heal a wound, you have to name it, and a lot of men are doing that very work of what what happened to me? Where is that trauma? What um, what, what is that fear that I feel? What is that inner terror? And mm. a lot of men have begun to get in touch with this and to cry about this wound, yes. you know, this very early, early wound. Um, but the and 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 I think in doing this too, it leads to much more healthy sexuality, a health, much more healthy interaction with your uh, partner or mate. But, but, yeah, absolutely. The foreskin is the best part of the penis. We, in the, in the third and second and third international symposiums, I told you I had organized. Uh, Dr. John Taylor, a Canadian pathologist, came and spoke and talked. To, said, "What exactly is lost?" And he's done the research. This, his research should be printed up in the British Journal of Urology soon. Um, and he he talked about the foreskin being to the penis what the fingertip is to the finger, and uh, an interesting way of. Mm. Seeing that or understanding what that is, the head of the penis, the glands, glands, by the way, means acorn in Greek, which is with the shape of it. Also, there's the glands clitoris, the same analogous tissue in the female. Um, but the, the glands feel pressure. The same as now, if you rub your, if you run your fingernail on the back of your hand, 
that's the sensitivity of the glands of the penis. But if you run your fingernail on the palm of your hand, mm. you get a much different sensation. Those are the kind of nerve endings that the penis contains, mm -hmm. that the foreskin contains. This is what's lost. So the two major com complaints I've had, and that's, that was what it was le leading to, is these complaints from men who've been circumcised at infancy. What do they complain about? And for years, nobody did. What, what man wants to say something's wrong with my penis? Yes. Particularly in a sexually sick society, but um, but when these men men began to start complaining, they began then to know that they were not they were no longer alone. And what do they talk about? They talk about loss of sensitivity. They talked about uh, so much skin is removed that they have tearing at the at the scar site or painful erections. Because really, in truth, the foreskin allows for full accommodation of uh, I mean, for accommodation for a full erection. Yeah. And when it's when it's removed, a lot of men have very tight, painful erections, yes. um, and again, tearing at the scar site. It's also a very small little tissue that we're working on in the infant, and so there's, then babies don't come in with cut on dotted line, doctors cut here or there or wherever, so men have been left with hunks and slices missing, skin bridges, curvatures, a lot taken off of one side, not the other, mm. so much so that, 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 that the penis curves. There's, again, loss of sensitivity, and which increases as, as the years go by, retarded orgasms, uh, anorgasmia. Mm impotence, all of these things, not to mention the anger and resentment they feel that someone did this to them when, when they were too little to consent, resist, or escape. <laughs> mm. and, and, oh, there's one more aspect of that, because we talk about the sexuality, the, there is a difference for the woman as well. The, when the penis erects, elongates, the foreskin doesn't retract, it actually just sort of slides out <laughs> with, the, with the elongation process, and so the inner lining of the foreskin becomes the shaft of the penis. Now, the head of the penis has remained soft, moist mucous membrane because it's been protected and covered. Mm. A woman's vagina is also mucous membrane. These are the tissues that are meant to come in contact. Now, women, women complain commonly in America, go to the doctor and say, gee, it hurts when my husband enters me. He's like, oh, it's because you're so dry, you need to use lubrication. Mm. If her husband were not circumcised, and that would be my question, is your husband circumcised? Mm. Because if he is, uh, he needs lubrication. He is not bringing yes. the normal lubrication. Yes, ab so absolutely. It changes. It's for, for both partners. Everybody suffers. Yes, right. <laughs> Well, again, we, we we live in such a and then we're gonna, we're gonna take a break. We live in such a schizo, uh, sexually schizophrenic society. When, when it when it comes to matters like this, we and and this 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 is one of the root causes, at least in my opinion, of a lot of the sexual misinformation that we have out here with young people. Young people are confused about sex, and and of course it all started out to, with this procedure, and then it continues, and then we have vast. Uh, ignorance out here because you have uh, um, various groups who do not want sex education in the schools <laughs> or uh, don't want any sex, edu sex education of any kind to tell people or not giving information about abortion or about birth control or nothing. So people go around wondering what they have or what what um, what they sh what they should be doing or what how they, how to keep themselves clean, etc. It's it's a really it's a mess. It's a total mess. That's one of the reasons why we're in this condition that we're in right now. Indeed, and and when you, and when you look in countries like Sweden, where it, sex education is taught, where the kids have uh, are given condoms, where where it's an op they're open about what's going on. They don't have the high teen pregnancy That's rate. Right. They don't have the rampant sexually transmitted diseases. It's only this lack. Of, of, of education that's allowing us to be put ourselves in this terrible mess. Absolutely. It's really a shame. It really is. We're going to take a brief break, and we'll come back, and we're going to take phone calls for the, for the remaining few minutes we have in this program. This is Walden's Pond this afternoon. Privileged to talk with Marilyn Milos. She's the, she is the director of the National Circumcision Information and Resource Center in California. We're talking about, as you know, male circumcision. Oh, boy. <laughs> we'll be right back with uh, more of the program here on Walden's Pond, here on WBAI. Please stay with us. Greetings. This is Joe Willard of Natural Hygiene Incorporated. I'm on WBAI every Saturday from 12 noon to 1 p.m. If you've missed me on Wednesday mornings, please listen in on Saturdays, 12 noon to 1 p.m., where we create the conditions for health 
and well-being. And be sure, be sure to love yourself. You are very beautiful. Marjorie Moore, formerly host of Wednesday Talkback. Bet you thought I wasn't here anymore, but I'm here on Mondays at 1 p.m. following Gary No. It's called Talk More. It's a new show with new ideas, a new me for a new you. That's Mondays at 1 p.m. following Gary No. here on WBAI. Let's talk more. You gotta be tough, you gotta be stronger You gotta be cool, you gotta be calm You gotta stay together All I know, all I know, love will save the day You got your food, you got your food, you got your food 99.5 FM, WBAI, New York And we're back. Yes, we are. On Walden's Pond, on WBAI, listener-sponsored community radio in New York City, the heart of New York City. It is 145 Eastern Standard Time on the eastern seaboard of the United States of America. Shelton Walden here, your host of Walden's Pond. We're here every Thursday between 1 and 2 o'clock discussing uh, the rights of animals, people, the environment, your health. And today we're talking about male circumcision. Distinguished guest Marilyn Milos, director of the National Circumcision Information and Resource Center, and um, and we will be taking we will be taking your phone calls very shortly at 212-279-3400, 212-279-3400 here in New York City. And you know, those of you calling from outside the borough of Manhattan, it is indeed 212-279-3400. Before we go any further, Marilyn Milos uh, and people, I know we want to get in contact with you. What's your address and telephone number? Thanks. They can call me at uh, 415-488-9883 or write to NOCIRC, N-O-C-I-R-C, P.O. Box 2512, San Anselmo, and I'll spell the Anselmo part of it, is capital A-N-S-E-L-M-O, California, 94979. Thank you. Okay, we'll repeat it at the end of the program. Walden's Pond here on WBAI 212-279-3400, 212-279-3400. If you wish to talk with Marilyn Milos, please make your questions very, very brief uh, because of the limitations of time. WBAI, you're on the air. Hello? Yeah, hi. Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for bringing up this, this topic. I wonder if Ms. Milos is familiar with the rituals in the Middle East, say, some of the villages, say, in Turkey, where boys of um, 9, 10, 11 years old are circumcised, and it's sort of a public uh, ritual in which the boys are brought to, um, I guess, a sacred place, and then their foreskins are removed, and they're paraded through the town in wagons, in sort of a parade, and um, their penises are wrapped up with white cloth, and pictures are taken. And I'm thinking of this in terms of what she said about the, vi- the anger and the rage that it produces in the infant, because these, these cultures are known to be particularly violent and anti-mother, and I'm wondering if, if she's familiar with that. Oh, you bet. And there's all kinds in, vi- in various parts of the world, various amp- you know, uh, mutilations that occur, both the male, the male and female genitals. Yeah, because how, how, how could a boy not feel angry? I, I had thought at one point that maybe it, when this happened to a boy, um, when he's a little bit older, that on some level that he could have pride of having succeeded and done this. At least he's, he knows he's part of the group and it's a, in some way a rite of passage. But but still, on a, on a deeper level, how could you not feel violated and maimed? Well, ab- absolutely. And I was I was witness to one of those things. Oh my! And when I uh, when Both I. Victims. I talked about it, you know, they, they kept saying, well, you don't understand, it's cultural, and, <laughs> and the boys afterward, I mean, I mean, they're visibly shaken, and they sort of hang their heads in shame. Yes. You know, they don't want to be seen, yes. and yet 
people are taking photographs, and yes. it's horrendous. It is. It is. And it's amazing, isn't it? We, we do this to children, and why? Yes. Because we can. <laughs> yes. And again, it's, these, are, these things are only done by dominated societies. You never see them in a nonviolent society. Mm. But Absolutely. Where, where love truly is, you don't see this kind of stuff happen. Well, thank you very much for your thank work. You. Thank you. Thank Bye-bye. you. Thank you, ma'am. Bye. Uh, WBAI, you're on the air. Yes. Yes, good afternoon. I wanted to uh, just make a comment to the uh, uh, show that's on now about the male uh, circumcision. Please, please go ahead, quickly. Go right ahead, sir. I'm on? Yes, sir, go ahead, please. Uh, what I wanted to say was that um, I uh, had am not circumcised, and I used to think that I was a freak. And it's nice to hear uh, a program like this because I think uh, a lot of men that are not circumcised uh, think that way. But uh, I'm close to 40 now, and I got over it a long time ago. Mm-hmm. But uh, I will say that not being circumcised is uh, is a good thing, and uh, it, um, it 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 does definitely add to sexual pleasure. And uh, um, it's just uh, nice to hear a show like this that uh, brings this problem to the forefront. That's all I had to say. Uh, thank you for your comments. This is really important, and your voice is very important. There's a new group called Intact Men Against Circumcision. And these, uh, I hope you'll join in with them. You can contact me, write to me. They'll give my uh, address out again at the end of the program so that you can uh, get in touch with this group. They have a newsletter now. And, again, it's intact men trying to come out to say we're okay. They know they're okay. They can talk about some of the yes. problems that they had when they felt abnormal. Isn't it amazing? You're the ones who are normal, and they've made you feel abnormal. That's just so – it's so um, – crazy but at any rate uh, there is a group and i encourage you to c- contact me and, and let me remind me that what you're after and i'll um get you in touch with these folks and sir i also want to say if i will that you you're bringing this issue to the four skin too yes <laughs> and, and um how would i contact you because i just turned on the radio a little while ago so i didn't hear any addresses before already. okay uh, i'll give a number the her telephone number is 415 yes 488 9883 Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye. Let's move on quickly here. WBAI, you're on the air. Uh, hello. I have two sons, and one of them is 30 and one of them is 15. And uh, with the one who is 30, I really didn't, well, I mean, I guess I did have a chance, but I didn't think of it. Mm. But uh, with the, the younger one, um, he still does have his foreskin. Mm. And I read about it a lot because I was getting a lot of flack from all my friends. And uh, mm. it, at the time, they said that, People who had been had been circumcised um, were more easily coercible. Mm. Mm. Okay, bye bye. Very interesting. <laughs> Have you heard that story? Um, no, but it's, it makes sense, doesn't it? <laughs> mm. T- uh, two seven nine three four hundred. You're on WBAI, Walden's Pond. Hi, uh, this is Shane. I called you before. This time, I'm in full agreement with the theme. Uh, I was circumcised at the age of nine, and by the way, it was in Turkey. Mm. But the most critical thing is not necessarily the medical aspect of it, the pain and all that. It's uh, the imposition of the religious idea or ideology or mythology, whatever, of the adults on the children who... Wonderful point. ...who will soon enough be adults themselves and they can choose their own religion and and what it may include and what it may exclude. Uh, By the way, in Islam, it's not... uh, all that important to have uh, a circumcision is called sunnet. Mm-hmm. It's the way of the prophet. It's not necessarily uh, a commandment or something like that. So uh, I can understand how some Muslims uh, can actually say, well, this is not terribly important. I'm, I'm going to do away with this uh, part of Islam. And it's perfectly within Islam to be able to say that. Mm. I'm not a Muslim myself right now, but uh, I can at least say with some authority that uh, it's no big deal to to be able to say uh, not this part of Islam. Mm. Uh, To go back to the psychological part, though, I think uh, it's a too crude brush stroke to say, you know, people who had had circumcision can be... Uh, more submissive or whatever. I guess I'm not submissive. Or to say that, you know, they will hate their mothers. Um, Being from Turkey, I can at least say that uh, a 
country of over 70 million people mm. can have quite a variation. Some may hate their mothers, sure, yeah. maybe violent, but... Um, Absolutely. Well, mm. It so happens that it's one of the countries where mm. um, crime rate is in bottom 20 percent. I mean, mm. among the uh, over 170 countries, it's you know, bottom 20 or something, if you mm. trust the statistics. Yeah. Uh, even though there was a civil war of some kind in the 70s, and now, you know, there's aggression by the military against whatever minorities and this and that, and Armenian massacres, whatever. Right. It's, it's safe not to make generalizations over such a huge population depending on something. Okay. So, so, okay, sir, I thank you. So small a circumcision. Thank you, sir. Bye. You know, he, he brings up an interesting uh, constitutional issue with regard to freedom of religion because uh, in, in um, it, well, it's just an interesting question. If parents have the right to practice their religious freedom in America and circumcise their baby and mark that baby as a Jew or a Muslim, that baby has lost his freedom of religion. So is the baby, or is he not, protected by the Constitution as a citizen of the United States? It is an interesting constitutional issue. I don't know if we'll ever get to court, but uh, it certainly is interesting. All right, let's maybe take one or two phone calls if we have the time here. WBAI, you're on the air. Hello, uh, you on the air? Yes, yes ma'am, quickly. <coughs> Yes, um, I think it's a torture for little babies, and psychologically what it does, it's uh, very difficult to really uh, find out, uh, but I think uh, it's, it's certainly bad. Uh, what I want to say for myself as a woman, I think a man who is not circumcised, it is much more pleasurable for me because um, the liquid that comes out of a penis when a man gets erected, it's um, a lubrication that cannot be pr um, reproduced by any artificial thing, and if if a man is circumcised, it kind of gets lost, you mm. know, it, 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 it gets in the bed sheets or, mm. or it's not really used for the purpose mm. It's, mm. it's supposed to. And mm. I was wondering if other women uh, feel the same mm. way. And again, I had more pleasure with a man who wasn't circumcised than men who are circumcised. Mm, very interesting. Thank you, ma'am, for calling. I hope this uh, program will be uh, repeated. Oh, definitely. Okay, thank you. Thank bye you. Bye-bye. All right. Um, we're out of time, Marilyn. Um, oh, thank you so much for addressing this issue. I'm, I'm just thrilled that you uh, took the time to do so. Well, my pleasure. And uh, it, it's really, I've learned a great deal doing this program today. Um, again, could you give us the telephone number and the address for your organization? It's 415-488-9883. Mm -hmm. And the address is NOCIRC, N-O-C-I-R-C, P.O. Box 2512, San Anselmo, capital A-N-S-E-L-M-O, San Anselmo, California, 94979. Uh, Marilyn Malos, uh, who is the director of uh, the National Circumcision Information uh, uh, and Resource Center, um, I want to thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Uh, very informative. I've uh, found this. <laughs> you really have... Uh, gotten to the core of a lot of issues, yes. particularly uh, to us men. Uh, good, good. Well, there's, there's, uh, there's more, so uh, invite me back or I can turn you on to other people. For example, there are a lot of men now who are restoring their foreskins. You can't get it back what was thrown into the trash, but you can stretch the tissue that's left and recover the glands and, re and get back some of the sensitivity so that it's something very hopeful. Things are happening that are hopeful to men. So, All right. Um, well, I, I'll, I'll, I certainly will. And I thank you again. Thank yeah. you. Bye-bye. Marilyn Malice on WBAI on Walden's Pond.